So da Dalton's law um, talks about partial pressures, and that is if you have a mixture of gases, it's actually, this is really simple. Um, don't ever overthink this, any problems like this. All it says is that the total pressure of the gas, of a mixture of gases, is going to be the sum of the partial pressures of the individual components. So if you have a mixture of gases, so here is kind of a container, and you have gas A, B, and C, basically it says that the total pressure is going to be the sum of the partial pressures of A, B, and C. Um, so what does that look like in terms of a problem that you might see? So here's an example. So whenever you breathe out air, a sample of an exhaled air is going to contain um, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, carbon dioxide, and water, right, water vapor. And it's going to have a total pressure of 760 millimeters of mercury. And it says that the partial pressure, if you were to measure the individual pressure of nitrogen gas, it's going to be um, 562 millimeters of mercury, of carbon dioxide, 118, and of water, it's going to be 50 millimeters of mercury, what's the partial pressure of oxygen? Well, you say that the total, which is going to be 760 millimeters of mercury, is going to be the sum of all the others, which is going to equal N2 plus O2 plus CO2 plus H2O. Well, N2 we know is 562 millimeters of mercury. O2 we don't know. That's going to be the one we're going to solve for. Uh, CO2 is 118 millimeters of mercury. And water was going to be 50 millimeters of mercury. So 760 minus 562 minus 118 minus 50 is going to equal the partial pressure of oxygen. So if we were to do that math, um, 562 or 760 minus 562 minus 118 minus 50 is going to equal 30 millimeters of mercury for PO2. And I put that little P there just for the partial pressure, the pressure of oxygen itself. All right, so that would be your answer for that one. So again, Dalton's law is very simple. It's just all the components make up the whole. Um, just really briefly talking about gases, uh, Ozone is a particular type of gas that your books talks about, so you guys are all, I'm sure, familiar with the ozone layer. So ozone is actually formed whenever O2, right, reacts with O, right? Usually most oxygen in the world is going to be regular O2. That's our normal oxygen that we breathe and that our body does stuff with. Um, solo oxygen atoms are going to be the problem. And these solo oxygen atoms will react with O2 to give us ozone. And that ozone is kind of that important um, shield that is that forms in the atmosphere itself. So ozone itself is a good thing, right? And that's the shield that protects us from ultra UV radiation. Um, so some lone oxygens go up there, react with our oxygen molecules, and we get ozone. That's great. Um, years ago, there were these things called chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. And they were very prevalent in a lot of um, propellants and in refrigerants and things like that. But eventually, scientists became aware that these CFCs would react with the ozone, causing the ozone to break down. Well, when the ozone broke down, you lose that um, ozone layer, and we would have holes in that ozone layer, which would allow the ultraviolet radiation to come directly um, from the sun and hit the Earth without being... Um, kind of fractioned out like it does. So usually the sun comes in, the UV kind of gets mainly soaked up by the ozone layer. Whenever you have a hole in the ozone layer, though, that UV radiation comes directly to the earth, and that causes um, a lot of problems. In particular, if you're out in the sun without sunscreen, it can lead to skin cancer. And we'll talk about kind of some of that stuff later on this semester when we get to the biochem part. Um, so talking about gases in the atmosphere, so 
greenhouse gases are named this because basically they absorb energy that normally radiates kind of from the Earth's surface. So the kind of holds on, these greenhouse gases hold on to that um, energy and kind of make things hotter. So CO2 is considered a greenhouse gas. And a lot of people will talk about how increased levels of CO2 is what's being attributed to global warming. Um, I don't think that's an appropriate discussion for this class. There's actually a lot of different explanations on why um, temperatures may be increasing you know, on the Earth's atmosphere over time. CO2 levels could very well have a large part to do with it, but there's other things as well, and I don't want to get into all of that. But what I like to point out is um, kind of just as a, a scientist and someone who's looking at data, and as you know, a lot of you are pre-nursing um, students, and if you're not a pre-nursing student, you're a public health student, you're going to be analyzing data and kind of making decisions with it. So one thing I like to point out with this particular graph that's shown in your book is there's a very... Um, noticeable uh, pattern to the data. And that is this zigzagging point, right? It goes up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. So you can see so here is this up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. So the general trend continues higher, right? And that's what they're saying, this increase in the CO2 could be attributing to higher temperatures. But I want to talk about what is this up and down due to? Why is it kind of this very consistent and regular and like regular um, spiking of up and down, up and down, and up and down? Well, if you were to zoom in on this a little bit, which I'll try to do here, and we were kind of to look at kind of within a particular piece of data, what you would see is that between 1960 and 1965, there's actually 10 points in there, which means that you're having two points a year which means that one point and then another point, you could attribute it to kind of say summer and winter, summer and winter, summer and winter. So if you're looking at CO2 levels, what is important in, uh, in carbon dioxide, right? So plants are important for CO2 because plants undergo what's called carbon fixation. So plants are able to take in take in CO2 and they create oxygen and sugar, all right? So that's kind of uh, carbon fixation and photosynthesis. That's what plants do. Um, so plants take in this carbon dioxide. Well, guess what? In the winter, if you're in Florida, you may not know this, but if you live in other parts of the world or other parts of the country, um, in the winter months, things tend to often get kind of brown and plants aren't able, aren't nice and green and they don't undergo photosynthesis like they normally do. So in those levels or in those times, what do you think would happen to the CO2 levels? Well, if plants aren't around, plants don't take in the CO2. So that means whenever you're looking at these spikes that are higher, this is going to be the winter. And then down here is going to be the summer. So particularly if this data that we're looking at here was looked at in one particular location, so let's say we were to measure it in, oh, let's say upstate New York, um, right, where things are really green and lush in the summer, and then in the winter, and then until the next summer, they stay kind of uh, greery and dreary and uh, gray. Uh, you're not going to have a whole lot of plants undergoing uh, photosynthesis, and you're going to have higher CO2 levels.